Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back, Pat. Welcome back. Hello, All Adam. of our listeners. Hello, this is Lost in Criterion once again. This week we're watching the 1968, no, not 1968, 1986 uh, British biopic on Sid Vicious and his crazy girlfriend. Not that he wasn't crazy himself. Uh, yes. <laughs> Co-written and directed by Alex Cox. I totally got distracted by myself there, Pat. Pat, go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, yes, I'm John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. And I am the Adam Glass, and as I said, you're listening to Lost in Criterion, the show where we watch all of the Criterion Collection. And at the same time. it's going to take time. us 20 years. It's, uh, well, I guess if we watch them all at the same time, it wouldn't take that long. Sid Vicious. Sid and Nancy. Sid and Nancy. Sid of the Sex Pistols. Uh, as I said, directed and co-written by Alex Cox. Starring Gary Oldman in one of his first breakout roles. Uh, well, film roles, at least. He was a stage actor prior to this, I believe. Um, Gary Oldman, of course, now internationally known for the Batman movies. Uh, <laughs> I'll pretend that's the first time he's been famous. Because this movie, I wasn't really a fan. Me neither. So I guess this will be a really quick podcast. <laughs> maybe, because... maybe. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Johnny Rotten, in the middle of this film, uh, Johnny Rotten being the lead singer of the Sex Pistols, uh, as, as Sid Vicious once again stumbles to stage, yells at the crowd, Have you ever felt like you're being cheated? That was my terrible Johnny Rotten impression. That actually was my terrible... But it actually was pretty much on par with the terrible Johnny Rotten impression <laughs> yes. that the actual actor was doing. That was actually my impression of Donovan Hill, who uh, guested with us a couple, a couple episodes ago and will be back soon. Uh, that's his impression of Johnny Rotten I was doing, actually. Um, anyway. So uh, this is your impression of his impression yes. of the movie's impression of Johnny, Johnny Rotten. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, I actually kind of felt like I was being cheated in this movie. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Sid Vicious, by the way, an, another great thing Johnny Rotten once said about Sid Vicious uh, that was not in the movie uh, is that uh, we'd have a better bass player if we hung it on a coat rack. Um <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Which obviously, given given what happens in this movie, and that begs the question, uh, well, or asks us to ask the question. That's not really a proper use of begs the question, but nonetheless, um, why is Sid Vicious still in the band? So, if anything, well, but you know, that's here's what I'm going to say about this film. Yeah. As a film, I hated it. Yeah. As a catalyst for me to go read a lot of stuff about <laughs> Sid Vicious. It worked, I liked it. It worked out. It worked out. Yeah, it did work out. That way. And and they there's a lot of information on the internet about um well, yeah. it was, this this fine upstanding young man. It was, it was, and it, it appears from everybody's perspective that the main reason he was in the band is because he was the most punk person anybody had ever met. Oh yeah. No. No, that's certainly true and and they couldn't they they could keep him around for uh, for uh you know, uh, the punk aesthetic. Plus, he was Johnny's friend. So no matter how much everyone else got mad at him in the band, Johnny would Johnny it would keep matter, him from, yeah. from getting kicked out. Um, but, uh, you know, think, think about it. Looking around, how many... I've seen t-shirts with Sid Vicious' face on them. I've never seen a t-shirt with, with Johnny Rotten's face on it. So. And it, it's... Yeah, it's really weird because, you know... As far as, like, actual musical talent is concerned, yeah. you know, Johnny Rotten's got him beat hands down, yes. but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> hands down. Compared to anyone else, well, no, but Johnny Rotten certainly no, has No, but compared to talent. Sid Vicious, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, like, the least musical person in the band is the one... Yeah. Eh, yeah. Well, he, was, not, he embodied... Let's not go there. He embodied punk rock for a generation, many... for, for a while. I mean, after... One thing this movie doesn't really get into, but but as a catalyst for reading about him, certainly it does. Um, one thing this movie doesn't... The aftermath of all of this is that, uh, basically, you know, Punk kind of died when Vicious died for a while. Um, and uh, this movie uh, doesn't really get into that, but definitely gets into the, uh, the punk rock aesthetic. I've heard this movie described as a... Uh, 
a, uh, a Romeo and Juliet for the punk rock age. And yeah, I believe that was Roger Ebert who, cla- who said that. Might have, might have said something that. Something like that? Yeah. Uh, we should cite our sources, but I can't remember. <laughs> so we'll go with Roger well, I think Ebert. That's, I think I remember we'll that. We'll go with Roger, Roger Ebert. Ebert but, um, but here's what I'm going to say about that, okay? Yeah. yeah, it captures the punk aesthetic, but it doesn't really... No. The entire thing felt like a farce of the punk aesthetic. It does kind of. It does kind of. It's just because... It felt more like I was watching Spinal Tap than an actual movie about even, punk rock. Well, that's the thing about Vicious. Even if we, uh, even if we are uh, completely on the level in how the movie presents him, and I, don't, I can't speak to the reality, so I don't know. I have to assume. Uh, but even if we're completely on the level, the guy was larger than life anyway. Well, right, but that's the weird thing is, is, like, in a lot of the interview stuff that I read, because I got more interested in reading about it than I actually did in the movie, um, they, like, Johnny Rotten, who I guess you should know, right? Yeah. Really describes, talks about it, I mean, you can even see it on the Wikipedia page, he mentions the fact that, like, this, the Sid Vicious we see on, in on the screen is basically a caricature of Sid Vicious's stage persona, which yeah. would be Sid Vicious. Yeah. The actual person was not that. Was not. Which makes sense, right? Because nobody can be that all yeah. the time. Yeah, well, Because yeah. if they're that all the time, they turn into this movie. Yeah. And people aren't movies, you know? I, I know usually, that's a really common usually, way to say it. Usually but, people aren't movies, that's true. But you know what I mean, like... Yeah. Nobody's larger than life all the time. Yeah. Well, Harrison Ford takes a crap in a toilet <laughs> like a person. This is what I'm saying. Are you sure... Yeah. I mean, I've never seen I'm it happen. Sure. I can't... It might be on the Millennium Falcon, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe just a toilet I, shaped you know, like the Millennium you know, Falcon. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean, though, right? Like, yeah. It's, no, I understand what you And that's what, what I think doing. one of the things that makes this such a little bit farcical for me is that I can't look at this and say this is the story of real people. Well, yeah. And there are certainly scenes that lend to farce within this movie, uh, for instance. Well, especially some of the ones where he obviously is intentionally yeah. being farcical. Well, like, yeah. The kid's running away yes, and he says when he says he's Sid Vicious. And they speed up... When did this turn into a Benny Hill film Yeah, they speed up the film and play like a spaghetti western music as the kids scatter. And all the kids scatter. Even the one he's trying to save from getting beat up. Everybody runs away in this little Benny Hill sped up thing. So yeah, obviously that's very farcical. Some of the dream sequences get there, but in a sort of dark farce. Um, like the, uh, the the stage show when he's doing his solo album. <clears throat> and there's all the uh, the gathered dignitaries, and he ends up shooting up the place, and he shoots Nancy in the chest, that, and then she gets that up and they I walk enjoyed. away. It was enjoyable, I but it was still a dark scene. farce. Um, yeah. The, the very end, which uh, well, I guess we can talk about now, too. Um, mm, why not? Obviously, we don't need to go in chronological yeah. order of the film. Yeah, I, obviously another yeah, dream sequence. Yeah, the flying off in the ta- yeah that the taxi. The flying scene off in the is... taxi, but but even before that, he goes to this pizza place that's in it's it's the only building a, standing in like a, a dump. Seems to be on like yeah like yeah. Alcatraz Island or yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> it's completely destroyed. He eats this half a piece of pizza, throws it away, walks out, and and in well, it flips the table on the flips way. Flips the out. table. It's yes, one now. of the most uh, one of the most realistic movies to to what or sort of nods to to what's happening here. He walks out and he he gets into a very uh, short argument with uh, some break dancers. Uh, which, which is kind of you know where the counterculture was headed after Sid Vicious died, um, right? Or at least a different sort of counterculture that came to the prominence more than punk rock. Uh, and then, and then he gets in the taxi, and Nancy's in the taxi, uh, despite having died two hours ago. Um, well, actually, about a it month was, ago, I think, within the way movie. More than that, yeah. No, it was a month in the movie, but it was two hours actually. You know, as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, it's a bit slow. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then. Uh, and then they drive away. Pacing. So, um, so yeah, there's there are some pacing issues, um, but I'll, I'll be honest. We get into that sort of farce, but at the same time, I like a lot of what they did, and the dream sequence certainly add to it. Uh, get a feel for you know what he might be going through mentally, uh, being you know a heroin addict. Um, well, here's the thing, okay? Like I always kind of have a problem with film, and films do this sometimes. They decide to tell me what being a heroin addict is like through absurd delusional fantasy sequences and I never feel like 
I know anything more about being a heroin addict after than yeah. I did before. Yeah. No. You know what I mean? Like these delusional. It always just seems. I don't know. I can't deal with it. Like. Yeah. Every film I've ever watched that has these kind of sequences, I sort of get like, okay, I get it. He sees weird shit. It's you could have put up a, a title card that says he <laughs> sees weird stuff, <laughs> and it would have accomplished the exact same thing because, like, frankly, like these insane things that happen on the screen don't do anything yeah. for me. Yeah. And no. maybe that's just me on a personal level, but I feel that way during any film that does this kind of thing. I think selling the drug use uh, just by seeing how they interact with other people and each other is, is better. And like, and works a lot during better. those scenes, like Gary Oldman does a great job. Yeah. Yeah. And you really buy into like, man, he is, there's something wrong with him yeah. because of his drug use. And that's all I really need. Yeah. Yeah. The way they interact with each other, the way they interact with the outside world and people who are trying to help them and talk to them. Yeah. And the people who aren't trying to help them, like uh, Nancy's yeah. family, when they go see them. Who just <laughs> I like Nancy's family. Nancy's They're my family. favorite characters in the film. They're, they're... They're like, oh, we're going out of town <laughs> tomorrow. I like that there's like 20 of them all in the same house. And oh, they're all shoved into that one dining room. No, I, I love guess it, that, though. That's my favorite Christmas scene. No, no, it's definitely like, a great scene. And then they just kick them out. It's like, no, you're yeah, going like, to the it's hotel. Like, uh, I just uh, love it. Yeah, like, well, why go, can we go with you? No, no. Well, I, I love how like the kids <laughs> shouting in the background, like, I didn't know we were going anywhere. Yes, where yes. are we going? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so great. It's beautiful. Like, again, it's, it makes the movie come off more as a comedy yeah. than it does as a serious film about... Yeah. Well, anything, but it's still a great scene. And if you take this movie as a comedy, I almost read it. It you know, the film to me almost reads better as a comedy. Uh, co- co- uh, gosh, yeah. English is hard. Comedy than it does as a serious biopic or analysis of punk culture. Or, but then like if you look at like the Wikipedia page and the quotes from like Alex Cox, he seems to be under the impression that it's a. There's, pretty hardcore film or something. There's definitely, like, I, there's definitely some I humor in there, whether whether or not it's it's meant to be. Um, I do one one other thing I want to say about that family scene is it does lead into them being at the methadone clinic, uh, which is the closest the movie gets to actually having a point. Um, <laughs> when the uh, <laughs> the the African American guy giving them the methadone uh, berates them for being strung out all the time and tells them that they could be selling healthy anarchy. Uh, but instead, they're uh, they're always on the drugs. Well, and that and that's an interesting point. It's like, yeah, like every so a lot of the things I've seen about like talk when they talk about this film is how it's sort of in its own special way an anti drug film. Yeah, I, and it is, but at the same time, I think the farcicalness of it kind of ruins that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Like I really felt like if they had just shown without the dream sequences or anything like that. Just these two characters descending into complete madness and nightmares. Well, yeah, which is really what they're they're descending into. Yes, right. It, 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 and then eventually one of them killing the other, which we again we don't actually know if yeah. they kill. You know, yeah. then we get into a really foggy area about whether or not that's even true. But yeah. then the point is, is that like at that point, it would have been it would have been a very good anti drug film because you're watching somebody who was famous like somebody who defined yeah. a culture in a lot of ways destroy themselves and yeah. I, but because of the whole farcicalness of it you kind of i just end up writing it off yeah well, I, I guess so. yeah if anything in this if, if this movie has any sort of point it's an anti-drug movie yeah um, and that's one of my problems with this movie is that it doesn't really seem to have a point uh, yeah. Other yeah. than that, and I don't need someone to tell uh, to tell me in a two hour movie that doing heroin is bad. I already know that doing heroin <laughs> yeah. is bad. But, but like, I mean, I get it. Like, I mean, I've, there are other good anti drug films that do yeah. a better job than this one of saying like, look, if you do this, it's going to ruin everything. Yeah. And but sometimes they're interesting films. Beside yeah. that, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, but this one kind of lacks a plot, and so yeah. It's, I mean, and, and biopics kind of do that, especially with people who don't really, I mean, within, within pop culture, <laughs> within punk and pop culture, Sid obviously became something, uh, but it's still, you know, he doesn't really, none of them amount to anything. Nancy and Sid are both bad people, and they're bad for each other, yeah. and they're even worse together, 
Uh, and it's just, I mean, I could watch, you know, the Kardashians and I'd feel just as turned off. Um, and, yeah, well, see, it, I think that's a big problem for me. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, I, I feel like I'm watching reality TV. Yeah. Like, really bad reality really TV when I watch this. Really reality TV, and I don't... And it's like, oh, man, like, do I want to be spending my time watching this? I don't yeah. know. Which is weird, because it's become, like, a cult classic, apparently. Yeah. And I don't quite understand, except for maybe the fact that people really like the farcical elements of it. Yeah. Because I can see that. Some of those scenes are just ridiculous. Well, I think I think it's more that Sid's place in history is this iconic thing, and being the movie about Sid Vicious, uh, right? This but movie again, we get into the level. fact that we don't know that we don't really honestly believe that this is an accurate portrayal of Sid yeah. Vicious. So, unless you're an idiot, but it's it's the portrayal we want because it's how we right okay vicious. because yeah this is what we want we yeah. if you if you're really into Sid Vicious then you we want would. Sid Vicious to just be over the top all the time yeah never a human being exactly. i guess i can buy into that so basically I, I, everybody who likes this film is delusional the, or the, really likes farcical elements yes the moments where he is more human though uh certainly certainly play a lot better you know Gary Oldman's acting even when he's silent the, that opening scene where it's just him stoically sitting on the bed and uh, the the police officer yelling, "If you <laughs> did you yeah. call nine one one? Did you call nine one one? Who called nine one one?" Um, you know that's a great scene, and the whole framing element. You know, while we're on that subject, of this being him recounting how he knows the girl <clears throat> um, that they just pulled out of his apartment. And, you and know. but that's the thing is like we. <laughs> That's where we get into the point of like, man, this could have been a much better film than it was. Yeah, is yeah, my point. Really is that like, yeah, the setup, Gary Oldman's acting, all of that leans towards this could have been really excellent. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, it really feels like parts of it feel like they have the making of this like wonderful film that like really digs into like this man's descent into complete loss of self and madness and. And instead, we kind of get that plus Benny Hill. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit of a little bit of farce on there. And that that that's weird. It doesn't sit well with me, and I think that's yeah. the problem. So for me, at least, I yeah. No. Um, I did like actually now that now that I'm looking at my notes, uh, one of the first things we see uh, uh, Sid and John doing, uh, well after they uh, after they're uh, Vandalizing that car, they go into the uh, the apartment. Uh, they meet Nancy, and they uh, they lean back on the couch and yell, "Exterminate! Exterminate! Exterminate!" And I like yelling. I like Doctor Who references, no matter where they pop. Yeah, up. I understand that. I do. So that was that was interesting. Uh, there is there is one thing uh, to mention real quick uh, to to bring this back into reality. Um, the actress uh, who is screaming as they pull Nancy's body out of the uh, out of the Chelsea Hotel and onto the street. Uh, the the girl screaming is actually no uh... oh, no. How did I just lose her name? Oh, um, I have no idea where this is going. I was going to just shout Jason Statham just to no, for fun. It's, it's not Jason Statham. I wish it were, but he's not a woman. <laughs> um, and yeah, no, it's, it's thematically not, appropriate. It's why I wanted to mention it. Is um, it? Oh, um, Courtney oh, Love. No... It's Courtney okay, Love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember reading it. Yeah. She yeah. has a super minor part. Yeah. Super. In the film. Super minor part. And Courtney Love, obviously, in Courtney Love's uh, persona when she started to become famous, very much aping Nancy, and that's a bad idea. Well, um, apparently, I was reading on on the Wikipedia page where I get all my information about this film. <laughs> um. Well, not all, but some of it, most yeah. of it. Um. They uh, mentioned that I guess she really, really wanted to play Nancy in the film, but they turned her down because they needed a actor with experience. Yeah, yeah. But they created this. that part just for her because, yeah, she was too good to pass up completely. Yeah, yeah. I remember when Courtney Love was too good to pass up. Yeah. Then she, uh, then she killed her I husband. Don't. Oh, I mean, didn't kill her husband. Um, he committed suicide. That was... Ah. Mm. Oh, 
let's not spend any more time. I'm talking about conspiracy Courtney theories Love. about the best, <laughs> the death of Nirvana. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Who knows? Anyway, I read um, a really interesting article. I think it was on a certain shall remain unnamed. Uh, is it, shall is remain it, is it Wikipedia again? No, 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 no. It was actually cracked. But oh, okay. talking about like being a left-handed guitarist playing a right-handed guitar was probably the major contributing factor to why he <laughs> killed himself. <laughs> that is that is a very interesting place. For no, it. it was actually really compelling. I think it was on crack. But the it, article it, was it really compellingly was. written about how much pain he would have been in from that. Yeah, no. Well, that, so, that, kind of make, interesting. that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. In, in a very, very... Totally basic. unrelated to what we're watching, right, or what we're talking about right now, but I just thought, <laughs> yeah. I just, it was such a weird thing to see on... I think it was Cracked, but it was, was really that, interesting. I, 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 I've got in my notes... my The soundtrack for this is great, but there's one moment where uh, somebody walks up and, and starts singing a song. Uh, I can't remember who they're... Uh, who they're talking to. Um, it's uh, it's while they're on the American tour. Because there, there's that great shot on when they first get to America of this whole entourage. They got two buses, a helicopter, bikers, uh, <laughs> uh, trucks, all driving through the desert. And that's how we establish we're in America. And it's just, just this steady shot of them coming out of the horizon <laughs> toward the yeah, camera yeah, yeah. For, like, for like a minute and a half or so. <laughs> It's probably only like 30 seconds, but it's just, it feels so long because we're just watching it forever. Um, but one of the first people they talk to in America then, I think he's on the bus. It might be another member of the band. I was really unclear. Oh, the dude, the, the, no, no, the, the, I think it's like maybe their opening act or something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not clear on who this person is, or maybe it's like a roadie or something. Yeah. I want a yeah, job. I want a job. Is... I want a good job. One that satisfies my artistic needs. Yeah. It's a great that's, song. That's my favorite song ever. Yeah, I really wish they had actually like presented that as a song in the, you know what I mean, in the soundtrack. Like if that had been like some really crappy band that they dug out of nowhere and yeah. put on the soundtrack, just playing that song. I want a job. I want a good job. I want a job that satisfies my artistic needs. I can't remember how the actual like tune goes, but it's, it's it was beautiful. That. It was like, I, and I just that. well, cause well, like, but. It, there's a couple weird moments in this film that seem to be talking about other genres of music that will will or have been popular at the same time. Yeah. Like you get like you get like the break dancing thing and the uh that whole kind of thing at the end and that's kind of a like those guys are definitely leaning towards like hair metal and weird things like that. It's Yeah. No. no. It's like I think you're right. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be like little jabs or like, yeah. like the guy they the guy they go to his hotel room music the guy whose hotel room they go to, who's who's um, cleaned and cleaned himself up. Still, he has this very you know, pop hair metal. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, we never even see him perform, but it's still, unless I, I don't think that's the same guy, but no, it's not the same guy. No, no, no absolutely. Um, that's actually right. Right around there, uh, right, and just after they get to America, there's a scene of, of vicious getting beat up uh, on some yeah. railroad tracks, and then and, and, and I, then his manager, is yeah, it's manager? the manager. It? I'm yeah, pretty yeah. sure it's his manager with the fake, walks with the gun, but no gun. <laughs> walks out, makes hand, gun noises. His hand has a gun, and it works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not only but then make it gets noises. weirder because then, like, yeah, he after that dude runs away. He shoots the other guy with his yeah. fingers, yeah. and the man like collapses. And the it's, man collapses. It's um, just absurd. Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I would like to know the reality of that situation, whether or not there was really a gun there, because there there are there are allusions to um, the mythos. More, I mean, this movie buys into a lot of the mythos of, of, of Sid Vicious. Uh, but there are allusions to it too, and that seems that seems like a time, you know, whether or not he actually had a gun. Um, another time when that happens is the, the entire death scene. Um, one of the theories is that you know they were having a party, and Vicious went to bed, and Nancy stayed up, and one of the dealers came back looking for had money fight, that she yeah. had, and they had a fight. Um, so we get the one dealer that we see repeatedly in their in their apartment. Um, at one point, accuses Nancy of, of taking a bunch of money from him. 
Um, so that kind of sets up that, and then we never really see him again until he's the one who discovers. Um, yeah, yeah, the it's body. I. Yeah, I understand, and yeah, and I understand that like to make this movie feed into the Sid Vicious mythos, it has to be him who kills yeah. Nancy. But yeah, like I, the actually the arguments in favor of that guy being the murderer <laughs> are pretty compelling. Pretty- yeah, like do you see on like Wikipedia and some of the links on Wikipedia, it's like, mm, man, this guy really seems like he's guilty. <laughs> more than likely, more than likely. So. Yeah, uh, it makes more sense than than Sid. You know, with the knife disappearing, I don't. I, yeah, and then the maybe, money also. There being like yeah. no money left. Yeah, uh, it's it, a bit it, odd. it it makes a compelling argument that it was someone else, and obviously, you know, he wasn't convicted of killing her. Um, right. Yeah. And, or outright murder, considering he, he never went to prison. He just spent a few months in jail. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, they don't get into uh, his actual death, really, which kind of surprised me. Which is I mean, kind of weird, because yeah. if you're going to make an anti-drug film, yeah. the death of Sid Vicious is actually a little bit almost yeah. more compelling, because he the cleans himself death. up in prison. Yeah. And is is no longer doing heroin, and then dies of an overdose at a party for him, for the, yeah. his release from jail, that apparently his mother ordered. Yeah, the way they treat his mom in this film wouldn't lend itself to that ending. No, no, but um, he's uh, he is kind of you know treated as kind of a mama's boy a little bit uh, by Nancy. I don't, um, and uh, you know, obviously he wants to. He's really intent on cleaning up the apartment when it looks like she's going to come visit. Um, but we only really see her for that moment, and all she does is drive up, and then they're in the street having an argument. So she kind of disappears. Um, so you know, she's she's not really set up as diametrically opposed to him, but she's certainly not set up as anything that's feeding into what he's doing. And yeah, his, yeah. The stories of his actual death suggest that she was very much feeding into what he what he was. Well, and that she was also a, a yeah. registered drug user. Yeah. And yeah, it's so yeah. like I'm just saying that that would have also made a very compelling story. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess um, ma- I mean there's enough documentaries on Sid Vicious that probably made a very compelling story for somebody else's movie. Yeah, and obviously the way the way they chose to end it with him joining Nancy is very you know. It's, it's a symbolic of their whole suicide pact thing and, and staying together and the endless love, whatever. Not that they really deserve it. <laughs> yeah, like, they, I don't really buy into the endless love for them anyway. Like, they're really, yeah. like, they're probably, dumb. I guess, it's the heroine, but... <laughs> they're really bad for each other. Yeah, they, they are. They really yeah. are. And, well, and frankly, like, yeah... Yeah, they're basically the worst couple that's ever existed. <laughs> yes. if, if this movie is accurate. No, I which I why one reason I like it being described as uh, Romeo and Juliet for for the punk rock is that not only are they incredibly immature people, uh, there's a lot of collateral damage, and that's that's very I guess realistic. that's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, to, to the uh, Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah, it is. Uh, but that is a fairly accurate allusion to say that it's the punk rock Romeo and Juliet. Like, yeah, I mean. To, Romeo and Juliet is even, for each other. even really worse. I mean, they, the whole thing lasts three days and six people die. <laughs> this this at least lasts a couple of years and only really two people die. So I guess it's a little better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, yeah, I definitely see what, Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good illusion. And it's just, yeah, it's just watching them, though, it's like, oh my God. It's so it is painful, especially yeah. considering, I guess, honestly. I would have to say that Nancy's character is pretty well acted too. Like she yeah. is, no, they're both intensely they're both frustrating actors. human being to watch, and I guess yeah. that's what they're going for, right? I mean, this yeah. woman is watching her live at all is like painful, hurts yeah. a little bit. You're like, why are you doing these things that you're doing? Oh, it's the heroin. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it's really, it'd be interesting. Because cause we meet her, and you know she's she's already addicted, and oh, yeah. there's there's a certain suggestion that she gets him addicted. 
Well, um, and there's a certain suggestion know. that he's hunting for it too. Like, yeah, yeah, because he, he he asks he asks her. Yeah, um, well, yeah, it's not a suggestion. He actually we meet, does. Yeah, but. we meet we meet him and Johnny, and they're they're drinking, but they're not. And there's no there's nothing within this movie that suggests Johnny Rotten is is in on the whole drug scene. Which I don't know how. Well, and there's, that a, there's, is an, in fact, there's a lot of things suggesting that in this film that he's not interested in it at all. Because yeah. like, there's that like scene where like, um, Sid's doing his first hit, I guess, and like Johnny Rotten's playing with a car in the next room on the floor yes. or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Like just trying to ignore what's going on. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, but we don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about Johnny Rotten to know. One way from another, so yeah, but. <laughs> and that's because he's not as big a character. So yeah. He's not as apparently not as compelling. Um, I just, there's there's one scene. Uh, oh, where was it? They start to kiss, and there's just like garbage falling all around them. They're in an alley, and they start oh, to kiss against yeah, the yeah. dumpster, and it's just garbage falling. And I think that's very uh, symbolic of their relationship. <laughs> Yeah, there's Whatever. some. Good, I mean, like I said, there's some really good scenes that if they didn't have some of the other annoying elements, would have made yeah. altogether a pretty good film. But yeah, I don't know. I just have trouble getting over some of the things that frustrated me about it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's some of them are a certainly... little bit too big to get over for me. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot. Um... He's very frustrating too, though. Nancy, Nancy's very frustrating to watch, but but Sid as an artist is very frustrating to watch, especially when he's on his own. Not only do we have <laughs> oh the gosh, fact that he can't man. we can't that he can't play bass, period. But when he's when he's trying to uh, do a solo thing and he's the lead singer and literally has the lyrics to the song on a piece of paper taped on a piece of paper right in front of his face. Yeah, as, as he's singing, <laughs> that is. Well, yeah, yeah, like, that last one where, like, yeah, the last one where he's alone and the backup band's not even there, that yeah. did a pretty good job, though, of making him seem really pitiful. So that was actually yes. a pretty good scene, I felt like. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we definitely, there's definitely points where we try to pity Vicious, which kind of, you know, at the same time, pitying Vicious, but we don't necessarily, the only scene we really get to pity Nancy in is the scene with her family. Yeah, and like, well, Nancy, overall in this film, is a much less... Sympathetic character. Yeah, yeah, like, Sid is supposed to come off as sympathetic, but I yeah. think we're supposed to hate Nancy. I'm not yeah, sure, I don't but really, I feel like we're supposed to. I don't really necessarily like that aspect yeah. of the movie. Because well, it, yeah. they're very... They're bad for each other. It's right. not just nobody's that, worse than that the other. Nancy's one not in this bad for yeah. yeah, Nancy's not bad for Sid any more than Sid's bad for Nancy. These people should not be together. Yeah, they shouldn't even be in the same. Like, by no continent. means is it one or the other's fault. Yeah, and, you know, but it does Nancy, make it off as Nancy's fault a little bit, and that's a problem. And even it. we do we do get a short thing where Nancy, and that's there's moments where she's better, and. But it doesn't balance out the rest of the movie. Like when they're back in New York and they're doing the solo thing, and you know they're on the methadone, so they're they're trying to get clean. Um, and then she or at walks least, in yeah, at and least Sid's, clean enough to like perform. Yeah, yeah and Sid Sid's doing stuff with uh, one of the other guys playing with them. Yeah, and she you know she yells at him. She and she berates them. There. But then it breaks down because, like, she's like yelling at him, like, "Well, we, you agree we're not gonna do it, and you know, like, yeah. we're done." And like, and then the last thing she says is like, "And you didn't even save me anything or something like yeah, that." And then exactly. it all falls apart. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah. The and Nancy. then they're both right back into it. They're yeah, both right back into it. They're not. They're not strong people. No, but <laughs> yeah, like it's it's unfortunate that Nancy comes off as the bad guy. Yeah. When she's she's really well, and it's really weird not. because we're also supposed to identify Sid's sort of decline based on the fact that he eventually kills her. But as she's portrayed in the film, she's a bad guy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like no, she's, she's the is. villain of the film and the she love interest. And at the end, we have like Rip, Sid, and Nancy. I find that I found that sort of that portion a little bit distasteful in general. That I don't know why I I've not put my finger on it exactly, but that final scene, uh, that final thing, it's like 
it's like the director was saying was kind of making the jack off motion while he said like wrote it on the screen yeah you know what i mean it's like oh i don't actually care that you guys are dead but here i'm gonna put this thing on the thing it says rip sid nancy you know what i mean does that make sense like it's like yeah obviously our our viewers cannot see me but my hands going up and down while i'm saying rip sid nancy that is another moment where i think the dialogue of the movie very much uh represents my reaction to what's happening in the movie uh, because just just as that's happening, uh, you know, right before that, I guess, uh, Sid gets into the taxi, and the breakdancing kids are yelling at him, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that really feels like what I, how, I, how I'm reacting to the movie at that moment. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. He's yelling that at Alex Cox. Yeah, well, it's weird, because, like, and there's, there's this quote on Wikipedia from him. About yeah. why he had to make the film. I don't know if it's accurate or not. But I think it... Oh, no, I don't have it up. I'm really disappointed with myself. Oh, no. But it, it says something to the effect that, like, I had to make it because I didn't... Oh, man. It's the most arrogant thing you could ever read. <laughs> it's so crazy. Okay, here we go. I'm going to find it. I'm going to be the first one. Oh, I can't find it. I can't find it. Uh, crap. Oh. This is really, um, well, now I'm just disappointed in myself. I can't find it. It's a great quote because it's just like, wow, you're an asshole. This is all you can think when you read it. Um, wow, this is suddenly take a really negative turn, this podcast. <laughs> Let's let's spend more time just us I'm so silently sorry. reading the Wikipedia article. You say something. Um, <laughs> you say something really insightful while I hunt for this. I I think it's very uh, indicative of this movie that, uh, and you know, John Johnny Rotten uh, makes a point in his autobiography to mention this uh, that Cox never talked to him uh, as they were moving <laughs> as they were making it. Uh, yeah, I think that's planning a- it as he was writing it. Never talked to Johnny Rotten at all. Um, they did talk to Joe Strummer, who was in The Clash, uh, but... Not really relevant. <laughs> not relevant at all. Um, but, yeah. Uh, you know, Johnny also says that he thinks Gary, Gary Oldman was really great in it. Um, but that even, you know, as you said earlier, that even, even Gary Oldman was playing the stage persona, not the actual real person. Um, but, yeah. So it's, it's... You know, exactly that. Uh, Cox wasn't looking to make a movie about Sid Vicious. He was looking to make... Well, he wasn't looking for a movie huh? about, you know, John Smith, John Simon Ritchie. He wasn't making a movie about the real Sid Vicious. He was making a movie about Sid Vicious as, you know, he was, as he was presented. Um, well, and that's the weird and I thing think is that it would have been. I think honestly, it would have been a better film if it had actually been yeah. about the real Sid Vicious. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because um, the dichotomy of you know what he like in real life versus what he's presenting to the world uh, adds to the downfall, really, as he becomes the character, or at least is engulfed by the love of the character. Um. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> it certainly it would have been more compelling to me. <clears throat> um, oh my god! Maybe Sid I made this all quote up in my head. Maybe you did. Maybe you I don't did. think I did. It it was the most arrogant thing I've ever read. I don't think I made it up. <laughs> it's going to drive me nuts for the rest of the thing. But it basically came to the point where he's like, "I don't want people to." I had to make it first because I didn't want to think people to think that they were that Sid was really punk that I'm way more punk than he is or something like that it was the most like yeah what well am I making all... this up it can't be I'm making this up well that's that's one thing you know even their manager once said you know Johnny Rotten's the voice of punk and vicious is the attitude yeah um and this movie is all about the attitude of punk it's not about the reality of these people. It's about an attitude. Um, 
Yeah. Well, uh, I'm really disappointed in myself. Um, oh, I found it. I found it. Oh, man. Okay, <laughs> Cox went good, on good. to say that one of the reasons he was attracted to the project was that he was afraid that if someone else made it, it would portray its subjects as real exemplars of punk like I am, rather than sold out traitors to it. <laughs> now, mind you, I would kind of agree to a certain example, that, or to a certain extent, that like Sid really kind of it helps to portray him as not really like that he is kind of sold out because a lot of people kind of agree that he it was but yeah i like, mean it's it's not but like the, say that the rather like than I am. sold out traders but then saying like real examples of exemplars of punk like i am that that yeah, like that, i am makes it the most arrogant statement i ever read in, yes, on pr- yes, in print it really does it really does it really does no and, thank know, goodness so it, i found it i was so worried i'm i'm so glad that you did um no that's really that's really something interesting to ruminate on um alex cox uh much more of a terrible person, I think. Yeah. yeah, and that really, like, after I read that part, I, like, ended up rereading the, the Wikipedia article and reading a whole bunch of other stuff, and I'm like, man, I just can't get behind this film, because this guy's a, yeah. a douchebag. Like, he's yeah. really um, awful. See, I have a problem, because he doesn't really portray them as as any sort of punk rock sellouts yeah, I mean, it's, all, it's still it's, because it's still all about the attitude and it's yeah. all about we're so instantly focused on Sid Vicious persona that you know in order to to say that they're sellouts in any way would require us to you know I don't know we talk we talk about them getting three thousand dollars or five thousand dollars for three shows and that's not really that much money for a New York show um Especially for somebody on Sid Vicious's level, right? Somebody um, this well known, like he could have just. I mean, I, I mean, suppose, I suppose that's a lot of money for for punk rock shows, and you know, even. You, I I I saw recently uh, a listing of like you know what Green Day was was making when on their first national tour was like a hundred bucks a show, um. So you know, five grand for three shows. That's what uh, math. Math is hard. Yeah. I don't do it. This is why I stay away from it. <laughs> it's 1600 a show, more or less. Um, and that's a lot of money. That it is, is a lot of money. but I don't think that's what makes him but he's, a sellout. But it's a also split. Rock you know, it's split four ways still. It's split four ways. Yeah, still. I don't. But that's the closest we get. That's the closest we get to suggesting that. Yeah, it's really weird because, yeah, that's like one of his now, yeah. like, if, now that I finally found it. If Cox is trying to justify yeah. the movie because he's portraying them as sellouts and not as real punk all stars like himself, um, yeah, then I think he definitely he definitely does not achieve his goal. Yeah, it's weird because yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Like that's one of his stated goals, but then like later on, he's like, I wanted to make a movie that's anti drug. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I think Alex Cox was probably Cox was probably pretty high when he made this film. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. And didn't really know what it was about. It was just shooting whatever random crap popped into his head or something. I mean, like, yeah. following the general path of Sid Vicious's recorded life. But, like, I don't know. It's... I, the whole thing kind of comes off a little bit distasteful, distasteful, especially after you read that quote. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. He uh, he has cited Kurosawa and uh, Sergio Leon as, as influence. But who and does get a little bit... We get a little bit of spaghetti western influence, actually. Stay, uh, yeah, very, very every, explicit in this movie. But every film but, uh, on planet references or characters as his influence. Like, yeah. no, it's certainly true. There's kids in junior um, high school making films with like handy yeah, cams really that are saying like Akira Kurosawa is my main influence. Yeah. yeah. So. No, that's even no. That just that makes him even more pretentious, yeah. I think. But, but you know, there's a certainly. Uh, there's a certain well, level. He, if he had gone whole hog and made it like crazy spaghetti western, as it would have been interesting as well. Like, really, yeah. the fact that he didn't pick a theme and really run with it is, I think, the major failing of the film. Like, if he had gone oh. with any interpretation, one of the things that he presents to us and stuck with it, it could have been good. It could have been completely farcical, would have been interesting. It could have been completely serious and followed, like, kind of stuck to what it shows us in the first five minutes of the film would have been great. Yeah. 
but I don't if... I don't want to get too too really far off topic, but I just remembered that uh, that Alex Cox called Dick Cheney the architect of nine eleven, and <laughs> oh well, okay, so uh, that's, that's all we really need to know. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a little bit of a disconnect from all, from a uh, from reality, I think. Yeah. So um, what we've gotten down to is that Alex Cox is possibly a bad person. Yeah. Um That this film. I'll tell you is what. Re- his other big movie, though, Repo Men. Yeah. Repo Men was was an entertaining. I've never movie. seen it. You should you should definitely watch. It. I would recommend that over Sid and Nancy. It's it's very it's a weird movie. It is a very weird movie. But it's, it did it's very it, it did sound more interesting. I read the um, synopsis of it. I was like, yeah. hmm, this might actually be worth watching. Yeah. I don't think it made it into the Criterion Collection. Mm, that's a shame. But, uh, I can't watch it. I'm then. a little bewildered that Sid and Nancy. I am too, and that's. <laughs> I'm really starting to question the judgment of the Criterion Collection people. Between <laughs> well, Solo doing and this? this and Beauty and the Beast, I'm starting to wonder. But every so often they yeah. throw us something great, like the 400 Blows, where I'm like, oh man, oh, yeah. Obviously, some of these people do know good film when they see it. Yeah. But then sometimes it's like. I don't know. I guess within... If Solo's in there because controversial films get thrown in here. Yeah. Any movie that made a splash. I guess in a way this movie was controversial. Just by by nature of the fact that, that it, it focuses was, on Sid Vicious. That it focuses on Sid Vicious eight, Nancy. eight years after his death um, when, when no one's... You know, I, I'm sure there were still arguments going on about Sid Vicious... But you know, Punk's kind of dead at that moment, um, and and it comes out and portrays this very, you know, obviously John. I think Johnny Rotten would consider this a very contentious film, and and in that it's controversial. Well, yeah, he obviously <coughs> hates the film from everything you yeah. can read, and I think it's understandable yeah. too because he he, the person playing his character is a is a joke. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but he's not really... I don't know, though. He's not really in it enough to be a joke. <laughs> well, he is and he isn't. Just, like, yeah. He, yeah, his character's not very central to the story, which is also kind of, I would imagine, yeah. kind of annoying since they were friends and in the band yeah. together and... But at the same nobody time, nobody else is in the band isn't. Yeah, and I understand that. This but, movie's not called the Sex Pistols. Yeah, I this know, but is, you don't... Yeah. Do you think they, after they broke up, they no longer had any contact with each other? As this movie suggests, yeah, I, really I, I, doubt I that. find that very doubtful, especially when you consider yeah. like that the reason they broke up was kind of just because they couldn't do it. I mean, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's like saying that the Beatles never talked to each other after they broke up. It's like, no, I don't yeah. believe that. Nobody believes that. Nobody. It's not true, and it's the same sort of yeah. thing with this. It's like they they were friends. From the get-go, yeah. obviously they interacted afterwards. Now, maybe Johnny Rotten didn't want to have much to do with him once he fell into yeah. heroin-fueled madness, yeah. but I assume he still called on his friend once in a while. And I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely... Definitely uh, true. Um, <laughs> there, were, there were moments, actually, in this movie, and we talked about how sometimes the dream sequences, the, the fantasy moments, uh, could have been done uh, done better if they shot for something more realistic. Um, and I think the movie suffers with all the fantasy in at least one moment uh, where I wasn't really sure whether or not we were in a dream sequence. Which one? And that's when they start the fire. When they start the fire in the uh, in the hotel room. Really, you didn't like um, that? Because I actually... That was one of the few weird fantasy ones that I kind of well, liked because it, it was really cloudy on whether or not it was really happening or not. Well, that's that's the problem with me. Oh, really? Because... Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not entirely... Given that there there's actual repercussions of that, I, I don't think it's meant... I think it's meant to really be happening. Yeah. Um, but it's really unclear as it's happening whether or not... See, and that's really kind of why I actually happening. like that one. Because if you're going to f- provide me with... Here's an example of what a hallucination's like. I want it to yeah. be extremely unclear about what's happening. But with things like yeah. the I did it my or you know my way and then some of the other performance you know some of the other ones yeah. where it's so painfully obviously a dream yeah, or a delusion. It's like, "Oh, well, I don't really buy into that. This is just annoying crap you decided to put on the screen." 
But like the fire, you sit there going, "Man, is this happening? Yeah. Are they just sitting there ignoring well, if, a fire because they're too if high?" The fantasy to scenes, yeah. If the fantasy scenes were more ambiguous, like that scene, I think maybe maybe that scene would play better. Oh uh, yeah, me. but because it's the only one that's like that. <laughs> yeah, but because it's the only one that's like that, um, where where well, well, I guess it's not the only one that's like that. But the garbage raining down as they kiss is is kind of like yeah, that. but that's not a major um, one. Not yeah, like but that's one. that's more, and I guess this is, I I can't really complain because it's the closest the movie gets to symbolism. <laughs> yeah. The garbage raining down as they kiss, uh, them strung out in bed as the room's on fire. Uh, it's it's their life falling apart and them being bad for each other in symbolism instead of you know, uh, verbatim. Um, so yeah, so it I guess also gets it's, into the same the point few... where yeah, we already know this. Like at this point in the film, we're yeah. already well aware exactly. that they are bad for each other. Exactly. We don't we don't need the symbolism. But, but, but as a scene, I I actually liked it because of that. Yeah. It was the only dream sequence that didn't feel yeah. farcical to me. Um, yeah. I enjoyed I and enjoyed I his, because his, it was his stage be performance real. where he shoots everybody in the room just because it was so delightfully farcical. It didn't yeah. fit the no, tone was, the rest of the silly. tone of the movie very well, but you know. I feel like he could have gone either way, and he sat on yeah. the fence instead. And there's, there's, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, foreshadowing within that, because he shoots her in the stomach, you know, kind of where she gets stabbed, and then they walk away together, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, what happens at the end of the movie. Yeah. You know, he gets out of prison, and they they get in the taxi and leave together because they're always going to be together, um, which maybe is fitting because who else? Who else? <laughs> would be with Sid Vicious or Nancy Spongen, besides Sid Vicious and Nancy. Yeah, that's true. Like, um, nobody else would want to be anywhere near them, as we yeah. see in the film. <laughs> nobody really enjoys their company, for good reason. Yeah. I kind of want to eat at that pizza shop. Yeah, me too. To I kind of was thinking when that I is... saw it, I was like, is this a real place? Because I could almost believe it is. <laughs> Like yeah. they, they didn't bother to build a set. Like maybe there's just a pizza shop that happens to be like near a in the middle well, of this desolate wasteland. Well, land. like near a, like just if you if the angle's right, you can't see any other buildings. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. happens to be next yeah. to a uh, you know building that's been taken down or something like that, and it, from yeah. certain angles, looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Yes. I I Perhaps needed that someday. pizza place in a heartbeat. Oh yeah. Oh, Maybe yeah. we have. Maybe that was shot in Ohio. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, There's some places. I don't like think that. it was though. There, Toledo yeah. is a lot like that. <laughs> no, Toledo looks like it was involved in like a a, a giant robot war, like or something yes. like that. Something from like the Power Rangers or something. Toledo's <laughs> terrifying. Toledo's. It's getting. Bad. I, I haven't they, been there uh, in a long time, so. They did. They put a casino. Did there they? Now. Did they finally put but, roads on top of all the pillars? I think. I think they finally might have. Because <laughs> <finished. laughs> that was the most terrifying the part: the fact that there was just concrete <laughs> pillars jutting up into the sky everywhere you went. Well, they're tra- they're trying to make a sky. I know. I know. I know. To contextualize this for for anyone listening, um, what while they were building the skyway, the actual highway was still on the ground and snaking and between just kind pillars, of zigzagging, yeah. snaking between the pillars. The entire not really way. a highway looked, anymore. It, more of just a regular no, yeah. like thirty-five mile an hour road. Going yeah, between pillars, you couldn't, you couldn't go very fast, and uh, it's, as I recall, it was only like single lane. For yeah. Most of it. Um, well, I mean, obviously, single lane each way, two lane, but uh, but yeah, it was a ridiculous area. And that no, I really thought about our experiences in Toledo when we. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> when I was watching, yeah, that me scene. too. I was like, man. Ah. Uh, well, that that total non sequitur from this film, but you know. That's okay. This this movie is kind of a non sequitur well, from reality. So. We're kind of done, I think. I don't know yeah. that there's anything else to say about Sid and Nancy. Maybe yeah. some of the listeners um, liked it because they, I don't know. You know, it's an okay it's movie. Okay. It does it does some good things sometimes. It's just my my initial reaction you know, is I mean, it's a, it's a good that it's kind of but you know, it's there. It's, it's got there. Troubles. The movie exists. Yeah. I'm not I'm not angry at myself for having watched no, this. No, not like some of I'm our other films. I'm not disappointed in myself. I'm not disappointed in myself for having watched this movie. Um, I'm very much, I think, in agreement with Johnny Rye as far as... Yeah, me too. 
his reaction to this yeah. movie. Um, when I I, I, I read that I, I may that not, part I may of the not Wikipedia article well. after yeah. I watched the film, and I was yeah. like, man, he really nailed most of my complaints. Yeah, most of my complaints. Yeah, I think that's 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 very true. So, um, thanks for listening. Uh, next time around uh, is Ooh, goodness, what's next? Dead Ringers. I don't remember. Oh no, we need to be better prepared. Yeah, it's Dead Ringers. Dead Ringers. The is David next. Cronenberg, um, 1988. Yes. Film? 86, wasn't it? 88, was it 88. I, okay. It was the movie made right after the... Uh, yeah, we just watched that in 86. And 88 is, is next. Um, anyway, David Cronenberg's uh, psychological drama starring Jeremy well, Irons as twin gynecologists. Yeah. And that is that is probably the That's best all you need to know. you can ever get for a movie. That is, that is right there. That's all you need to know. So join us next time on... Uh, Lost in Criterion. On Lost in Criterion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I name of our podcast. Yeah, I figured. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> see you next time, guys. Bye. Thanks. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.